านประธานนายพิบดีกำลังเข้ามาในขอประชุมรางกำแหงจะได้รับการต้อนรับอย่างอบอุ่นยูเอ็กซ์เลนซีเลดี้สันเจนต์เมนดิสติงกิชคอลลิกส์ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิทยาลัยอันนี้ในวันที่สุดของปีนี้ขอนุญาตต้อนรับเข้ามาที่มหาวิ Mr. Jose Ramos Horta, the President of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste, was born in Dili, the capital of East Timor, to a Timorese mother and a Portuguese father who had been exiled by the dictatorship in Portugal to settle in Portuguese Timor. Mr. Jose Ramos Horta was educated in a Catholic mission in a small village in Sorbada. Tragically, four out of seven of his siblings were killed in a fight between the Revolutionary Front for an independent East Timor and the Indonesian military. Mr. Jose Ramos Horta was a moderate in emerging Timorese nationalist leadership. He was appointed foreign minister in the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste government, proclaimed by the pro-independence party in November 1975. When appointed, Ramos Horta was only 25 years old. Ramos Horta left East Timor three days before the Indonesian troops invaded to plead the Timorese case before the United Nations. He addressed the United Security Council and urged them to take action in face of the Indonesian occupation, which from 1976 to 1986 an estimated 200,000 East Timorese died. Mr. Jose Ramos Horta is a person of great stature, pleading for the rights and freedom of the Timorese people on the international stage for a period of 24 years during the occupation of Timor. During his exile, he became the permanent representative of Fritalin to the UN. He was the youngest diplomatic representative at the UN level and a prominent international human rights activist. He was also one of the three most important figures in the resistance movement for the independence of Timor-Leste. Mr. Jose Ramos Horta shared the Nobel Peace Prize with his fellow countryman Bishop Carlos Bello. The Nobel Committee chose to honor the two laureates for their sustained efforts and self-sacrifice in opposing the oppression of this small nation. A portion of the funds received from the Nobel Prize were used to establish the Jose Ramos Horta Microcredit Fund for the poor, which today is fully operational with a payback rate of 97%. In 1999, under the umbrella of the United Nations, East Timor held a referendum allowing the Timorese to vote on independence. When the referendum results showed more than 85% favoring independence, Indonesia-backed militia were unleashed across the country. At that time, Mr. Jose Ramos Horta returned to Timor to help rebuild the country from the devastating condition into which it had fallen. Working closely with the UN and Sergio Viejo de Mello, the head of the UN administration in East Timor. For until 2002, he helped to bring about peaceful elections of the country's president and parliament who in turn drafted the country's constitution. 
after serving for seven years as the new country's Minister of Foreign Affairs. When turmoil and civil wars threatened the new country, he stepped into the shoes of the Prime Minister and immediately set about restoring calm to the country. Before his appointment as Prime Minister, Ramos Horta was considered a possible candidate to succeed Kofi Annan as the United Nations Secretary General. However, he dropped out in the race in order to serve East Timor's Prime Minister. In May 2007, Mr. José Ramos Horta was inaugurated as the President of East Timor, a post he had held down to the present time. Mr. José Ramos Horta has been a political leader who has devoted his body, his mind and his wisdom to work for his homeland in a political role with a high degree of determination and awareness, which has benefited both Timor-Leste and the international community in general. His success has brought him honor as a promoter of peace at international level. Efforts surely worthy of our praise. Consequently, Ram Kamhang University Council has unanimously agreed to confer upon him an honorary degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Political Science. May I now invite the Chairman of Rangkumhang University Council, Mr. Prajwab Chayasan, to now read a special announcement in honor of Dr. Ramos Horta, the President of the Republic of Timor-Leste. Mr. Chairman, please. Dr. Jose Ramos Horta. Jose Ramos Horta was born in Dili, the capital of East Timor, to a Timorese mother and a Portuguese father who had been exiled to what was then Portuguese Timor by Salasa dictatorship. He was educated in Catholic mission in the small village of Sorbada. Of his eleven brothers and sisters, who were allegedly killed during the struggle between uh, Fortlin and the Indonesian military, a moderate in the, uh, the amazing Timonese nationalist leadership, Jose Lamos Mota was appointed foreign minister. In the Democratic Republic of East Timor, a government program by the, the pro-independence parties in November 1995, when appointed Minister Jose Ramos Horta was only 25 years old. He left East Timor three days before the Indonesian troops invade increase the Timonese case before the United Nations. Jose Lamos Horta arrived in New York to address the UN Security Council and urged them to take action in the face of Indonesian military uh, on source which would result in over 200,000 East Timonese based between 1976 and 1981. During 24 years of the occupation of East Timor, Jose Lamos Horta was international voice of Timonese people. In exile from his country from 1975 to 1999, he was the permanent representative in the United Nations for Timonese independent movement. The youngest U.S. A UN diplomat in history and an international human rights figure, he is one of the three central figures in the country's struggle for independence. 
in 1996, he was awarded the Nobel Prize and the Nobel Peace Prize with Bishop Carlos Bello, the religious leader of East Timor, in honor that sustained and self-sacrificing contribution for the small but oppressed people. A portion of, of the fund received from the Nobel Prize were used to establish the Jose Ramos Horta Microcredit Fund for the poor, which is a full operation today, with a payback rate of 97 percent. In 1999, under the umbrella of the United Nations, the Timor held a referendum allowing the Timorese to vote on independence. When the referendum results show more than 85 percent favoring independence, Indonesia backed militia under uh, across the country. They killed thousands in the street. They displaced hundreds of thousands and burned 85 percent of the building in the country. After the entry of the uh, UN peacekeeping force, Jose Ramos Horta returned to his homeland to help rebuild the country from the devastation, working closely with UN and Sergio Buera de Mello, the head of the UN administration in East Timor until 2002. He helped to bring about peaceful elections of the country's president and parliament, who in, in turn draft the country's constitution. After serving the seven years, was the new country Minister of Foreign Affairs. When, team, when turmoil and civil war threatened the new country, he stepped into the shoe of Prime Minister and immediately set about restoring calm to the country. Before his appointment as Prime Minister, Jose Ramos Horta was considered a possible candidate to su uh, succeed Kofi Annan as the nation secretary law. He dropped out of the race in order to serve as East Timor's Prime Minister. But he was indicated that he might run for the UN position in some time in the future. In May 2007, Jose Lamas Horta was elected as President of Timor Leste. On the whole, Jose Lamos Horta was a political leader who has made sacrifices uh, both mentally and physically to achieve political goals with both wisdom and uprightness, all in the consciousness. Therefore, deserve his native country, his unflagging efforts have benefited both the people of Timor Leste and international community at large, thereby making a great contribution to international peace building initiatives. His achievements were extremely uh, uh, exemplary and clearly worthy of our collective this trust, the Ramkam Hang University Council has unanimously agreed to confer an ordinary doc doctor degree of philosophy degree, political sign, upon him as a lasting sign of our acclaim. And now, Your Excellency, Permit me to ask the President of Langham Hang University on behalf of the University Council to present you the degree. Thank you.
May I now call upon the President of Ramhang University Council to present a bouquet of flowers to His Excellency. I now call upon the President of Rangkamhang University to present a bouquet of flowers to His Excellency's I would now like to invite the Chairman of Rangkamhang University Council to propose a toast to our distinguished guest, His Excellency Dr. Ramos Hota, the President of the Republic of Timor-Leste. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you, all of you, to join me and toast for the congratulations of the President of Timor's Letters, uh, President uh, Jose Ramos Hota, for his uh, doctorate degree in political science from Lam Lumhang University today. Congratulations. I would now like to call upon Mr. Uva Moravat, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to introduce Bridges. Mr. Chairman, please. Sawadee Krab and welcome to the second ASEAN event series Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political uh, and non-religious foundation Sandipa. under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. Um, the events are hosted in cooperation mm -hmm. with various Gantatan, local partners, including yeah. some of the country's major Sandipa. universities. Sandipa. And I thank Ram Kham Heng University for hosting our event today. Sandipa. Having started in, in November 2008, Bridges is now being continuously held in Thailand and Malaysia until April 2009, involving the Nobel laureates from all different fields. The second ASEAN series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows the series of 300 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand and the Philippines since 2003. 34 Nobel laureates, as well as 13 other keynote speakers and artists, such as Dr. Hans Blix, Demonita Rodic, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, and Dr. James Wolfenson participated in these events. In Thailand, many of them were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Maha Chakri Sirenton and reached an audience of 90,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 88 other national and international institutions, including 33 
major universities and schools. Me. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of Bridges reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves the awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. The globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. So let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer. An opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live in and which we are able to create a new constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace which needs the participation of everyone. We thank His Excellency President Professor Jose Ramos Huerta, the 1996 Nobel Laureate for Peace, who has agreed to come to Thailand to support the events. We now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues, honored guests, His Excellency Dr. Ramos Orta will now deliver the keynote at speech of the day, a speech entitled, Is Long-Lasting Peace an Attainable Dream? Your Excellency. The Chairman of the University Council, Your Excellency, the President of the University, Your Excellency, professors, adjunct professors, senior lecturers, students. First, I would like to say how it is humbling it's to be awarded the Doctorate Honoris Causa from such a prestigious uh, university that is the life of many tens of thousands of uh, students uh, in this country. Mm -hmm. But also what a great pleasure it is for me to be coming back to Thailand today in my capacity as a president of uh, my country. I had been visiting Thailand for many years in different uh, capacities and have learned to understand, to appreciate, to admire His Majesty the King the people of Thailand for your creativity, your resilience, your hospitality, and how you always prevail over tensions and conflicts and continue to build such a wonderful community uh, of people, such a wonderful uh, country. I'm accompanied in my visit to Thailand by my foreign minister, Dr. Zacharias Costa, who actually only a few weeks ago was elected president of his party, the Social Democratic Party, one of the five parties in the coalition government in Timor-Leste. He was maybe the lightest. He was also for many years a resistance yeah, spokesperson and particularly was our uh, representative to the European Union in uh, Brussels. The Secretary of State for uh, Natural Resources, Dr. Alfredo Pires. Come also from uh, a tradition of a long dedication to the, the country and the people. Our ambassador to Thailand, 
Dr. Jean Camara, a, a student leader in Indonesia, grew up in Indonesian occupation, was in prison, studied law while in prison and completed when he finished his prison uh, term. Today, uh, he is ambassador to Thailand and yesterday we inaugurated our embassy in uh, Bangkok. And uh, also, uh, the Dr. Constancio Pinto, today head of our bilateral uh, affairs division in the foreign ministry, but uh, graduated Brown University in uh, Providence and uh, master's degree Columbia University in New York and in many years charge d'affaires of our embassy in Washington. A student leader also during Indonesian occupation. And uh, Dr. Paulo uh, Remedius, my senior advisor, legal advisor. And uh, a staff member of the Mineral Secretary of State of Natural Resources and the other accompanying a staff of mine. I thank you all uh, for giving us the honor to be here at this uh, university. I begin by apologizing that rather than producing a well-written uh, uh, academic paper on this topic with uh, footnotes and references that are required normally by professors I have to confess, I haven't had the time to uh, write such an academic paper. So what you will hear will be an improvised, random uh, collection of thoughts on this very uh, timely and yet complex uh, topic. But before that, I have to thank uh, the International Peace uh, Foundation for uh, your uh, thinking of me. Uh, Dr. Morowitz for um, uh, inviting me to many of the programs that the Foundation has so successfully established uh, in this region. The theme is, is genuine peace an attainable dream? If you were to listen to uh, someone like uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he probably would tell you, yes, it is an attainable dream. I am a dreamer, but also I'm a practitioner of international politics and diplomacy. A casual student of humanities history, with all its wealth of uh, virtues and the flaws. And if we look back to humanity's history, it has been always a constant history of violence, of rivalry, of uh, suspicion, of prejudice, of jealousy. And as humanity expanded into organized communities and in numbers, we began to fight over land, over uh, hunting grounds. And these went on and on for thousands of years into today, where with the advance of science and technology, we did not succeed in the past 100 years or so in discovering vaccines, for instance, to effectively combat malaria that victimized millions around the world, particularly in the poorest regions of the world, Africa, Asia, parts of Latin America. And yet, our um, human mind has been able to develop additional killer of human beings, such as nuclear weapons, chemical and biological weapons, and all kinds of other weapons that increasingly and more effectively 
understand why about food wipe out and entire communities if not the human race with this uh, can we really honestly believe that with the tremendous effort goodwill of individuals throughout the world can we reverse this trend can we persuade the United States China Russia UK France India Pakistan North Korea I refer only to the declared nuclear states there are others who might have a capability and yet we don't know we suspect they might have the ability to produce nuclear weapons in a short period of time. Can we persuade them to dismantle the nuclear arsenal that we know either it is deliberate use or accidental use can wipe out entire communities and make the land unusable for generations to come. When in 1986 the Chernobyl accident happened, I thought this could be a warning, a sample of what would happen if an accident happened in the armed nuclear installation somewhere. And what if one of the nuclear countries were to lose control over its nuclear arsenal, falling into the hands of elements that might want to use it to blackmail the rest of the world. And yet, in spite of all these dangers, the powers that be continue to refuse to disarm. If we cannot persuade the nuclear powers to disarm, can we convince the non-nuclear powers to disarm their conventional arsenal? Because the smaller, the weaker, afraid of the larger, the bigger, believe they can defend themselves by arming themselves to the teeth as well. So that is the challenge, the dilemma that we face. And honestly, the answer to the question, is real peace attainable in the world? My answer to you, maybe in a hundred years, maybe in a thousand years, but at least not in my short lifetime. However, what can we achieve in each country, what we can achieve in each country in building peace block by block is how we can contribute to wider peace in a given region and hopefully eventually in the world. So each of us, me, my compatriots in my country, we have the responsibility to build peace in building blocks, house to house, aldea, village to village, sub-district to sub-district, district to district, and then hopefully peace is an attainable dream in my country. That I believe. However, peace has to start with each of us in our own homes. And peace is not only absence of war between warring factions, warring armies. Peace has to start at home where everyone at home, particularly the weaker, the children, the women, feel that they're in their home, in their sacred ground of their home, they are protected from violence.
meaning there is no domestic violence at home, no domestic violence against women and children or against elderly in our own homes. When children, upon leaving school, returning home, they fear returning home because there might be an abusive father or uncle or brother where else the child can go. Can we imagine the suffering, the loneliness of a child that is terrorized at home? Children must be able to walk from home to school in absolute freedom of fear. So the streets have to be free of violence. In schools, the schools have to be a safe haven. The schools cannot be ground for bullying by teachers or by colleagues because there in school, if they are subject to abuse, to discrimination, to prejudices, well, they will grow up bitter. In our villages, in our towns, in our cities, is it an attainable dream? to build peace in our respective countries, I believe, yes, it is an attainable dream. Does not depend only on leaders, does not depend only on those who hold power, depends on each of us at home, in schools, in our small communities. However, when we look back at situations in many parts of the world, you tune in to the news last night, tonight, you see the violence in Gaza, in Afghanistan, ongoing violence in Iraq, in Sudan, in Congo, in Somalia and many other less talk about situations of violence. We wonder whether the dream of lasting peace in these regions of the world is realizable. I believe so, that the international community working under the leadership of the United Nations, Secretary General, and the powers that be, people of great inspiration, like President-elect Barack Obama and others in Europe, in Asia. If we cannot resolve all conflicts in the world, we can resolve some that are taking the lives of so many today in this 21st century. But to attain peace, it might be a bit incongruent, difficult today to talk about mobilizing billions of dollars to help the poor. I don't know whether if I were to go to Washington today, I would be very persuasive if I were to choose the topic increase foreign aid to developing countries. Most of uh, the rich countries in the world are suffering this economic and financial meltdown with repercussions all over the world. However, there is an undeniable truth Poverty and violence go hand in hand. And if the international community does not redouble efforts to seriously address the root causes of poverty in many regions of Asia 
Africa and Latin America, every effort of those who are inspired by the notion of peace as an attainable dream will all be eluded. In this 21st century, we as human beings should ask ourselves whether it is moral that with so much knowledge, science and technology and so much money available today, much more than 50 years ago, there are still hundreds of millions of people in the world who cannot even have access to clean water, who live on less than a dollar a day, in most cases less than 50 cents a day. It is an indictment, extreme poverty, is an indictment of all of us, an indictment of leaders, an indictment of the wealthy, an indictment of the powerful countries, the powerful nations, powerful and rich. That in the last 60 years since the end of World War II, the international community has not been able working with developing countries to resolve issues of extreme poverty. Peace is not an abstract concept. Peace is real, is concrete, is palpable. It is, does not mean only, peace does not mean only a person living a life. Peace has to mean that he or she lives a life with dignity, with shelter, with food security. We cannot talk about peace while hundreds of millions of people in the 21st century remain in conditions of extreme, of abject poverty. In very recent years, last five years, under the leadership of the then Secretary General Kofi Annan, much more goodwill was mobilized to redouble foreign aid to developing countries, and much has been done. There has been significant increase in foreign assistance. The goal established by the UN more than 20 years ago of uh, persuading every rich country to contribute with 0.7% of their national wealth, GDP, for developing assistance has not been met. Only countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Finland have uh, reached and gone beyond the 0.7% of the, their GDP in assisting poor countries. Others, United States, fall very, very much behind. The rest of Europe, about the same, Japan included. 0.7 or 1% is a minute uh, sum, but would mean extraordinary difference, make extraordinary difference to the rest of the world. But that is not enough either. Foreign aid is important to help countries organizing their economy, organizing their infrastructures, administration, but solution is open market, access. When United States, Europe and Japan bring down the barriers to international trade, to free access for agricultural goods from developing countries, when they drop subsidies to their own agricultural sector that kill farmers, producers elsewhere, then I believe we would have gone a long way 
in eliminating poverty, one of the causes of violence, of conflict in countries. The challenge to us is how to address the issue of building peace, not only through annual United Nations appeals and declarations, not only through dialogue, but through real action focusing on the root causes of many of these conflicts. Will humanity be able in the next years to come to save our own planet from self-destruction? The warnings from scientists are clear. Water levels rising, temperatures changing, surprising for me, for anyone coming to Bangkok, it has been much cooler, pleasant, but a bit unusual. But for many of the lowland islands, Pacific islands, and as far away as Maldives, Bangladesh, these are real problems. To talk about peace, it is a multi-dimensional thing. It has to do with ending conflicts between states, within states, but it has to do also with reducing international arms arsenal, devoting more of the web money saved from weapons, from armies, to education, to health, to development. The agenda is extraordinarily heavy. However, while people like myself in my own country, which is small, a bit over a million, can do, can achieve much in our own country, and we are determined to build peace block by block, because we owe it to the people, we owe it to ourselves, it is in our self-interest, because of our conscience, our moral convictions, and peace, as I describe it, in a multi-dimensional form. Not only absence of violence in the streets, but absence of violence or fear at home, in the wider community, but also absence of abject poverty. We can do it in our little island, little corner of the world. It can be achieved in Thailand. It can be achieved in the Philippines. It can be achieved in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. It can be achieved in Colombia. It can be achieved in Gaza, West Bank. It can be achieved between Israelis and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. That, I believe, require leadership, require vision, require active diplomacy, creative diplomacy, to bring the parties to dialogue. But the dialogue presupposes no preconditions on either side. Dialogue means we talk and find ways how to bridge the differences for a common goal, for common interests. However, the greater dream of durable, permanent, attainable peace in the world, in our lifetime, in this century, I have uh, some doubts. We will, for a long time, we will always have uh, the threat of nuclear weapons hanging over us. For a long time, we will have a chemical and biological weapons stockpiling, threatening over our heads. 
I don't see how in the next generation, the next years to come, the nuclear powers, the major armies with massive conventional weapons ready to disarm. To end, I give you a little example of how even in our region of the world, fear, suspicion can fuel arms race. For the past 50 years, many people in our own region in Asia do not seem to appreciate U.S. security presence in this region of the world. And maybe because this security presence has prevented major conflagrations, we take it for granted. But assuming someone in Washington today decides we are going to pull out of Korea, of Japan, our navies will stop patrolling the China seas, the Indian Ocean, what will happen? Wouldn't we see an immediate arms race in the region? I fear there will be. And there will be also collateral damage coming from it. There will be loss of confidence and markets, stock exchange, currencies will collapse. This is only to illustrate the depth of fears, of suspicion, even in our region of the world. And that's where I think the idea of building bridges in Asia is so important. So that neighbors learn to trust each other, to cooperate for common security interests, and that means also food security, human security, rather than each country building up nuclear weapons or a stockpiling even more conventional weapons because we fear each other. I have to say, being leader of a small country that is part of Southeast Asia, Sometimes I ask myself why in Asia there has not been the possibility of Asians instituting an Asia-wide regional organization. It doesn't exist. As divided as Africa is, there is there was an organization of African unity, then evolved into African Union with even more effectiveness. And these from countries with very little resources, with history of a border dispute and violence. Latin America, the organization of Latin American states, the European Union, perfected perfected the organization into a political union that has become borderless, still with flaws, rivalries that we see in the media time to time, but they are inevitable or almost normal. This is not happening in Asia. And Asia is one of the regions of the world that is most nuclearized. India to Pakistan, Pakistan to China, China next to North Korea, potential nuclear power Iran. We pray that wisdom prevail in Iran 
that they will not attempt to become another weaponized nuclear uh, country. So as I, I do not wish to end my contribution to, it, to you today with such a uh, somber assessment of our region. Because the region of Asia is also the crossroads of the greatest human experiences, the greatest civilizations, cultures cross in this part of the world. Some of the greatest philosophers, some of the greatest human minds were born in this region of the world. We just need to travel from one country to another in Asia to be overwhelmed by the extraordinary history, culture, wealth, wealth of the region. And for this reason, I believe, with appropriate, inspiring leadership in Asia, Asia can be a truly peaceful, free region of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your keynote address. And uh, with your permission, we'll now have the question and answer session. I have the first question in my hand, and we would like to welcome two more questions from the audience. The first question being, was it Your Excellency's attitude toward ASEAN? And what is your expectation in regard to Moleste when the country becomes ASEAN member? Our uh, desire to uh, uh, join ASEAN stems from the very simple fact that Timor Leste is part of Southeast Asia. Geographically, historically, through thousands of years of migration from Asian continent and Pacific Island to Timor Leste. So Timor Leste is Asia. And upon attaining independence in 2002, but even long before, we wanted to be part of this regional organization. We are already uh, trade-wise, uh, economic-wise, uh, very much integrated in Asia. Most of our uh, trade is with Indonesia, some with uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, China. So uh, some of the very important links between countries, and that is trade, uh, is um, happening already. We need fuller political and diplomatic uh, integration. But even on the diplomatic front, uh, from the very beginning, when we attained independence in 2002, we already sought to coordinate all our uh, uh, actions on the international stage with the uh, ASEAN countries. Sometimes we have a slightly different uh, positions on certain uh, uh, country situations uh, or on certain international treaties. Timor Leste is one of the few countries in Asia that has no death penalty. We don't even have a life uh, imprisonment. The maximum prison sentence established down by our constitution is 25 years in prison. The constitution does not allow for life imprisonment. We ratify all major seven international human rights instruments. We uh, ratify the Convention on Torture. Uh, so, um, there are some uh, uh, differences, including on voting record at the United Nations, uh, but uh, there's in uh, 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 important issues, but the more uh, important uh, dreams and visions, uh, policies of our country is to seek 
total political, economic, uh, trade, uh, uh, integration with the region. We ties Thailand support and other countries like uh, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Indonesia. I mentioned some of the ASEAN countries that more actively support our membership. There is political consensus among uh, ASEAN countries for Timor Leste to join. So now it's uh, more a matter of our own uh, ability to prepare ourselves for uh, membership in ASEAN. The next question is, having been victim yourself of violence attack, what is your thinking on how to convince the leaders of the countries in ASEAN to work more towards place and tourism and to be more a real closely collaborative community to bring about common prosperity and security and sustainable development and peace? Well, uh, I uh, will not uh, seek to uh, pretend to uh, advise anyone. I can only talk about to my personal experience and personal um, uh, observations of uh, situations in, in uh, many parts of the world or uh, particularly in my own country. Uh, as you probably know, I was a victim of an assassination attempt for 11 February 2008. I was shot at close range, less than 20 meters, with a very powerful rifle, automatic powerful rifle. I survived. The doctors were surprised, impressed, that not a single vital organ was affected. I lost more than four liters of blood out of five before I arrived at the hospital. And when I arrived at the hospital, the doctor was surprised. I was still talking with them casually, explaining what happened. And uh, as I survived, I think it was God that wanted me to uh, stay on, on, on this planet. Do I resent, hate, seek revenge against those who try to kill me. I would like to add also that I was involved in dialogue with them. I was meeting with them. But that fateful day, something happened, and one of them shot me. Well, I felt sorry for them. Today they are in jail. This December 26, which is my birthday, you all remember, if you wish to send me presents, December 26 is my birthday. Unfortunately, my birthday is immediately after Christmas, so, and some friends of mine who are a bit stingy, they don't like to spend too much money on presents, they always give me just one present. They say, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year in just one present. And sometimes I feel also like giving them only one present for their birthday and Christmas. So you know, my birthday is December 26. I went to spend a few hours with the prisoners. Every year I've been doing that in the prison with uh, the people there. No matter what their kind, they are still human beings. And those who attacked my house and one of them who shot me came to shake my hands and I look at the assassin straight into the, his face, his eyes. I'm free. I'm alive. They are not free. They are the ones who have to live with their conscience. And uh, so I... But also... I... I'm head of state, but also a human being. As a human being, I forgive them. As head of state, I have to say, law must take its course. They have to face the courts and explain to the judges and the people what they did and why they did. But as a human being, I have to say, I feel sorry for them. 
because they are also victims of the crisis that happened in our country. The leadership failed in 2006. And when the leadership failed, a conflict erupted. Some of them took up weapons. In the end, their own president was almost killed and they became prisoners. My point is to say, never lose the political will to engage everyone, anyone in dialogue. In some circumstances, I understand why certain countries, whether the United States or some Arab countries or Europeans, say no to dialogue with Al-Qaeda and some other similar groups. We cannot uh, uh, make dialogue such a banal thing and say, let's talk with everybody. Well, it's, that's not what I mean. Unfortunately, there are certain groups that see dialogue as a sign of weakness. So there are always exceptions. But when we face with domestic situations, like in my country, I prefer dialogue. During the conflict in 2006, I met with many youth, many gangs, in many, how you say, unconventional situations. I was a prime minister and I was in the river, river dry river, meeting with more than 100 youth who were involved in violence chatting with them. I went to many corners of the city, engaging them in dialogue. Well, we, we, with that, we managed to help solving the, the crisis, of course, with international assistance. And we are never too proud to ask help when we need help. If I need help from an outside element, an outside power, an outside expert. Why not? Whether an American, whether an Thai, whether a Filipino or Chinese. For me, this is humanity and we should try to help each other. We should not because of pride saying, no, sorry, I'm not asking any outside uh, power. We're all humans. I went in 98 as far away as Colombia into the jungles of Colombia and the Amazon to engage in dialogue with one of the insurgency groups there called ELN to free some hostages. Why did I end up in Colombia, so far away from Timor? I went there on a visit to give lectures, UNICEF, a representative there happened to be a Filipino gentleman, heard about me, knew about me, told me about 15 hostages, teenagers held by one of the groups called ELN, and he thought they would listen to me. So, to make the story short, because it was very complicated to end up physically in the jungles of Colombia, well, they were released. I told them, uh, I had very frank conversations with them for hours. I was very blunt with them. I told them, I have no power behind me. I'm not an American negotiator. I'm not European. I'm a little person from a little country. I didn't bring any money to pay ransom. I came here to take the hostages with me. They are totally shocked. Well, uh, we are talking in Spanish, and I told them some, made some very rude remarks to them. How dare you, in the name of a cause, you kidnap civilians, you kidnap children. I told them in my country, if our movement ever does something like that, I would say goodbye to the movement, to the cause. You cannot justify an idea, an ideal, 
a cause, fight for it with this kind of violence. They were totally shocked. The UNICEF representatives accompanied me. He was shocked. Well, but uh, it helped. They released, and for the first time, that group released hostages without one single cent paid. A few years later, I was asked again to mediate another host situation with ELN again. I said I was too busy to fly to meet them in Colombia again. I said, well, we can meet at Madrid airport. Totally, totally secret. No one ever found out. We met at Madrid airport. And I told them again, I am not paying any ransom. And he said, the main, in a joking, he said in Spanish, Compañero, if every time we meet with you, negotiate with you, we release our hostages without any ransom, who is going to pay for our war? Because the ransom, with millions of dollars, is for them part of their uh, war budget against the government. They release again. Well, why they did it? Well, I put them in this very difficult choice. No one is going to pay ransom to these hostages. Either you have to keep them for, for many, many years to come, or you kill them and leave, call yourself a hero by killing innocent people. Well, they release them. Anyway, you, uh, I have had some experience of that in dealing in certain situations where people listen, even the most hardline, hardened individual. You might be able to open his mind and his heart. Sorry, that was already a long answer to a very simple short question. The next one is that you said that you oppose Western sanction on Burma. What are your suggestions on the Burmese problems? Well, uh, why I have said, uh, and this position is not new, at least I remember it was in 2001 that I issued a first statement on the question of sanctions on Burma. And I said it was time for the international community to find another alternative to sanctions. When you look at the situation in Burma, an impoverished country, impoverished in part because of the mismanagement of those who rule Burma for the past 40 years, in part, or I would say greater responsibility is theirs. And if that is so, the country is bankrupted because of incompetence, mismanagement of the regime, and because of their own political sins, we decide to punish. I know that the intention is not to punish the Burmese people, but the, it's a bit like when the Israelis say, well, we are bombing Hamas, but sorry that some innocent children are also killed. You impose sanctions on the regime in Myanmar, the unintended consequences is that tens of thousands of Burmese lose a job and become poorer. And the politics of isolation disconnect the Burmese people, particularly students, academics from the rest of the world. I, uh, that's why I don't believe it is moral and it is politically wise. So, uh, do I have a solution for Burma when uh, brighter people, more experienced people than I have not found a solution? Well, uh, the UN has had bright, brave people dealing with Burma. ASEAN has made every effort. The Secretary General and the different envoys. Uh, but if I have hope for a resolution of a situation in this world, I believe Burma is one 
issue that could be more easily resolved than, let's say, uh, the complex situation in Palestine-Israel. And it is a challenge to ASEAN, to Asians. This is an Asian problem, an ASEAN problem. Asians have to show ownership of the problem and ownership of solution. The non-resolution of the Burma question is an embarrassment to all of us. Same seat, Jose Porter, President of Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste. On behalf of the University Council and Community of Lam Kham Hang, is one of the largest community in Thailand. We so appreciate and so impressed about your knowledge and also experiences. During the was the Minister of High Education, you just initiate a curriculum, a graduate program that's peace and conflict study. This is right now many universities continuing that process. Today, I would like to ask your Excellency permission to join with us a new curriculum in Lam Kham Hang University. That will be peace, study, and practice. So it means to say that every student, 600,000 students, about more than 40,000 students graduate every, every year. If they don't pass compulsory subject, that peace, study, and practice, they cannot graduate. So this is we have one of the very, very a most important subject as a compulsory knowledge and morality. If you have knowledge without morality, without moral, you cannot finish from this, this university. Next, as this very auspicious occasion, that Excellency joining this ceremony, so we would like to invite Your Excellency to join us as honorary chairman of this curriculum. Then we will drop this curriculum and then we would like to visit your excellency as our part, as a part of Lam Kham Hang community. Uh, excellency, the boss of uh, former foreign minister, maybe one of my mistakes to include some of the ASEAN members. CLM, as you mentioned, maybe we don't have enough wisdom to solve. So I hope that my colleagues, the foreign minister, said, one of the most reputable and most respectable foreign minister, and he used to be our uh, lecturer in this university. Under his capacity and leadership as a chairmanship of ASEAN to be held in Thailand soon. I hope that we get full support for the inclusion of Timo Deleste to join ASEAN, to bring in the wisdom to solve many problems and conflicts of ASEAN. 
So again, I would like to thank so much and hope that Excellency is staying uh, very, very happy and enjoy a special weather in Bangkok. Uh, maybe 50 years, we never have such a very, very comfortable climate in this country. And from Boyan home, thank you very much. Now the time has come to call upon Professor Buddhisat Rajalan Sap, the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science as the representative of Ramhang University to present a small gift to our distinguished awardee in token of the esteem in which he is held by the university and as a small token of our collective appreciation. May I now invite the Chairman of Ramhang University Council, the President of Ramhang University, the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, and Professor Rang Sang Sang Su, uh, with His Excellency, uh, a group photograph. ถ้าภาพในครั้งนี้ด้วยแคนาดิกันบดีรองศาสตราจารย์คิม The second group will be Timor representatives. May I invite His Excellency Mr. Zacharias Abano da Costa, His Excellency Mr. Alfredo Perez, His Excellency Mr. Hao Priesta da Camara, His Excellency Mr. Constancio Pinto, His Excellency Mr. Godino Camo da Silva, Dr. Paulo Remedios, Mr. Francisco da Costa Monterio, Mr. Vincente da Costa and Ms. Gabriela Carascalo. Next, please, uh, the Minister, so Thai Minister of Foreign Affairs, the ambassadors of the Thai ambassadors of the Democratic Republic uh, of Timor Leste, and the ambassadors, please, Thai President Timor Leste, and the Minister of Other guest ambassadors, please.
The next group will be Ram Kham Hang University Council members and Ram Kham Hang University administrators, please. Chutta Pai Kho Rin Chun Thân Kham Khan Sapa Maha Vilay Ram Kham Hang Lạ Thân Phu Phu Vari Hán Khong Maha Vilay Ram Kham Hang Kha Now we have come to the end of the ceremony to present an honorary degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Political Science to His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Orta, the President of the Democratic Republic of Timor Leste. So I would like to invite all the invited guests to the Prapat Chai for the reception and refreshment. Thank you. และประทานอาหารบ้างในห้องขอขอนั่งอยู่ก่อนนะคะให้ให้แขกออกจากห้องก่อนนะคะขอนั่งอยู่ก่อนค่ะ